Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Okay, so this is Asia Tech Podcast live. We're broadcasting live on Facebook. My name is Graham Brown. I'm joined as ever by Michael Waits in the studio. And we're going to be talking about conferences. Michael, I've got a question this week from a listener, and it's Tell as me. follows. I want to tee you up with this because I know you have a lot to talk about on this subject. <laughs> This is all good. This is all good. And we don't, we, we don't pull any punches. Okay, so I got a, an Eric Chan in Singapore. He asks, I'm a startup founder, not new to the game, but I have a new startup. I want to get out there and I want to get into startup conferences, meetups, networking events. So much choice, especially in a place like Singapore. But for the whole of Asia, really, there's a lot of choice. Where do you start? Where would you recommend somebody like Eric or anybody else that's listening today, whether they are startup founder or investor or just somebody interested in this scene? What's the best use of your time getting out there? Is it actually worth getting out there and going to these conferences? What do you think, Michael? Yeah, I think so for sure, actually. So I have so just based on my own experience and on the experience of kind of everyone that I've spoken to, and it's really just pure you know, networking is really the wrong word for it, right? But how do you get involved in any kind of ecosystem? I mean, the real thing is just go meet people. And the best way to meet people is to go where all the people are. Right. Right. So, and I remember doing this five or six years ago when I first came to, to Bangkok. You know, how do I meet people in the startup business? First thing I did was I went and I started meeting companies. I just said, you know, I'm a potential investor. It wasn't even pitching. It was more just like, Tell me what you do and how you do it and who you know and who the important people are that have helped you get to this point. Mm. And then just keep meeting people. And I think the other thing to do is, you know, sponsor your own events really is the wrong way to say it. But like have a dinner and invite five people over. Invite two startups over for dinner. Mentor somebody. Like just meet. It's so important to meet people. What does that mean, right? So where are the best places to meet? Well, in Asia alone, right, you have at least – five people, four people that are running massive conferences, right? And we can go in any particular order, but Slush does something all over the region. They'll be doing something in Singapore. They'll be, they did something in Tokyo this year. 5,000 people were in Tokyo. We can talk about that. Yep. So Rise, which is probably the biggest, had 15,000 people in Hong Kong a few weeks ago. And it was just massive. And Rise comes out of sort of the Web Summit platform that comes out of Europe, right? You have um, Tech in Asia, and Tech in Asia kind of takes a different tact, tact to this, right? So they have Singapore, Tokyo, and Jakarta, which they've done none of those yet this year. But they try to hit the biggest markets in Asia. Jakarta, obviously, is in Indonesia, so it's the biggest country. There's some question, though, and I think there's some competition, actually, between Jakarta and Bangkok for who the biggest startup city is. There are just more people in Indonesia, but, you know, where are the best companies getting started? It's interesting there, too. But again, you've got to get out and meet people, and it's a constant thing. And I don't think it's really just, you know, maybe networking has a bad connotation. But I have this concept, so I didn't finish, right? And then you have Echelon, and Echelon actually does, and we can, should talk about each one of these, right? Echelon actually runs conferences in Malaysia. These are sort of satellite conferences that they do, right? Because Echelon has a, takes a different take on this, right? And Basically, what they do is they run individual, I'd say, smaller conferences in a bunch of what they call satellite cities. That's their satellites to their big event, which is called Echelon Asia Summit, which takes place in Singapore. And there they can have anywhere between two and a half and 3,000 people. So it's big. It's not massive, but it's big and it's hard to do, right? But historically, the Echelon, so the U27 team, has put on conferences in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, in Cyberjaya. In Thailand, which is generally in Bangkok, Central Asia. So they have a partnership where they kind of white label, not really white label, but they kind of rent out their name, Echelon, to a team in Kazakhstan, to wow. be fair. Right. Yeah, that puts on a conference there, which mm. is really interesting. And that, that conference still feeds into the Echelon Asia Summit. Indonesia, obviously, is in Jakarta. Vietnam is going to be in Ho Chi Minh in the Philippines, which is going to be in Manila. And the whole thing, what they really do is they've got individual competitions there. And they try to pull people from there into, um, into their big conference in Singapore. Mm. Right? But you have to attend these things, particularly when you're first starting out. Because it's the only place you can go to meet people. And it's concentrated, heavily concentrated. Everyone that's there is either an investor right, at any level. So they're venture capitalists, high net worth individuals, 
that's kind of in like sort of random people, rogue investors, basically just roaming around. Mm. But you also have journalists there too, so you can kind of see who are the journalists focusing on, who are the startups that are getting the most attention, right? And this is kind of the best way that I found, actually, at least at the beginning of my my sort of venture capital journey in Southeast Asia was to just to attend all the um, events and meet anybody you could. You just walk over. You never turn down. And I, I'll say this consistently on all of our broadcasts. Like, I never turn down the first meeting mm. unless the person is a real clown, right? Because you just don't know. Right. Are we going, right. You're going to run down the conferences. Are you also going to talk about how to network in those conferences? Because I'm curious. I think Eric wants to know as well about, you know, how to make use of your time when you go to these places, right? Yeah. So again, what I, what I like to do is what's your interest? Are you fintech interested? Are you ed tech interested? Are you just generally tech interested? It's hard to be generally interested and get anything good out of this conference. Think about it like going to, you know, a prom and not having a date. Right. I've done right. How do you just, yeah, so have I. Um, I'm not proud of it. But how do you, how do you decide who to meet? So mm-hmm. you have to have a strategy. Just like with everything else in life, you have to have a strategy before you go. So pick a topic, right? Or pick a stage of investing, right? So Rise, this is a big difference between, let's say, Rise. There was another conference recently called Texas. And Texas, there are mm-hmm. about 2,000 people there. This which is, is Bangkok, weird. right? Yes, yeah, in Bangkok last week, which is weird. It was last Friday and Saturday. It's kind of weird because they advertised it like there were 6,000 people there, but I was there and there were probably 2,000 people. But I'll tell you what, putting on a conference for 2,000 people at any one point in time, yeah, it's not easy to do. Like You should be super proud of having 2,000 people there, right? Um, so one of, the, one of the things you do is you just have a strategy, right? And Texas does kind of the same thing that Echelon does. And the reason why is because the people that put on Texas actually used to be the local partner for Echelon and they kind of branched out on their own and said, hey, we can do this on our own. Let's just do it for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And they did satellite events in other countries and then they kind of fed everybody into the big tech sauce event here. We can talk about how good that was and like what makes a great conference, but let's talk about how to meet people. Mm. It's much more important. The key is to have a strategy and to have that and to stick to that strategy. What type of startup do you want to meet? What type of venture capitalists do you want to meet? And what are you going to say to them when you get there? In other words, why does anybody want to know you as well? And so I see plenty of people do this, whether they're lawyers or sort of mentors or even just new founders. The key thing is make yourself important enough to meet, right? So make sure even having a T-shirt that has your company name on it is really important. But more important than that, share, right? Here's the thing. Hmm. Right. And we talk about this in multiple contexts. But the idea is you go to a conference is, and let's say somebody says to you, what are you working on? You say, oh, I'm in stealth. I can't tell you. Right. Forget that. So now you've just, but you, you say that, right? So you, you, you've dismissed that, right? But the reality is that I have that a lot. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can, you can talk to people and say something like this. Um, so what are you working on? They'll say, well, I just did a big, I just did a big deal for this company. Or I just did, you know, the hot, the hot topic now is I just did an ICO. Right, yeah. Right, so you did an initial coin offering. And you just say, because you're interested, really, how big was the coin offering? Now, you didn't ask who the company was, mm. right? But you want to get a sense for size and scale because you want to be able to have a follow-up conversation with that person. Is Sweet, what are the mechanics on that, right? But again, this is, you know, how you can help somebody else and how you can help yourself by giving away information that is... Slightly proprietary, but more interesting than anything else. But if that person responds to you, remember, they, they volunteered. I just did an ICO. I just helped the company do an ICO. Now, theoretically, there's you know KYC information here, but also sort of client and advisor privilege. So you don't want to know who it is. But I think you can ask them size. This is one of my biggest issues, right? So I said, wow, that's really cool. I'm genuinely interested. How big was it? Well, I don't know. Okay, so the, the, the mail that was written by Eric, right, he really wants to know how can I meet people. That's the worst way to meet somebody, right, because you've introduced something, right, and mm-hmm. now you won't answer the question as to right, how right, right. any kind of details. And so like, let's say Eric has a startup and he goes to, um, you know, the Rise conference. So the Rise is probably too big, right, because it's 15,000 people. We can talk about the effectiveness of some of these things. Let's say it was at Textos last week. Mm. 
And he doesn't know who he's meeting, right? Maybe the person's badge is turned around because all of these lanyards that they have are pretty terrible. They're definitely not optimized. And they make it really uncomfortable because they'll hang like around your belly and your waist. And no one yeah. wants to have someone looking at their belt, right? But that's what it is to see someone's name. So I would actually recommend to the um, to the conference creators is figure out a better way to identify people rather than having a lanyard yeah. with like a QR code on it. But putting that aside... You kind of don't know who you're meeting all the time, and and you don't if if you're new, you definitely don't know their status. So just you know try to give away something. If you say, look, I'm doing a startup in in IoT or in fintech, and someone says, oh, that's great, are you doing peer to peer? You say yes or no, depending on what it is. But you give the real real answer. And the other thing you do is just they say, wow, that's awesome. Are you seeing good traction? You can't. And if you say if you say yes. They're probably going to ask you, you know, how many users you have a month. Mm. Give the real answer. Mm. Like 100,000, 200,000, 10,000. It's just a number. And it's a moving target anyway. So, yeah, you've actually hit the nail on the head. And that is be honest. But what if that guy is not on your hit list? Is not a VC or an angel that you want to meet? Should you be talking to people who are sort of out of your hit list, off the chart, random people? Is that a waste of your time? No, because you don't know, right? I mean, it, once you figure out who they are, you can maybe have a better sort of understanding about how much time you should spend with them. But remember, if you're new and if you're new to an environment, right, you don't know if that person's cousin or sister right. or you don't know anything about them. So all you want to do is treat everybody as an equal, at least at the beginning. Yeah. But because think about this. If you, if you walk up to someone and you're a little bit standoffish and you're a little bit rude, right? If a venture capitalist who's a friend of yours or a peer of yours says, hey, I met, uh, I met Graham and I thought he had a really good business. The, the other woman who met you could say, really? I don't know. He was a little bit standoffish to me. Mm. And I just asked him a simple question like, how many users do you have? And he introduced the topic and then he was like, uh. I don't know, but he sells himself as the CEO. So my feeling on this is in almost all cases, it's better to be sort of nice and polite. And yeah. I like to use the word generous, right? Yeah, yeah. Because your generosity is going to go a long way. So if you're, if you're at one of these conferences, first of all, you don't know to whom you're speaking, right? It's the same thing like when you're driving, like you're not going to yeah. just be mean to another driver because you don't know. They could be like a friend of your mom. Yeah, right. That's right, got to so be your I, default, isn't it? I mean, you've got to be generous always. as a default. It's hard, though, always. isn't it? Because I don't know. I mean, what's your, what are your thoughts about conferences? I mean, I find it a little bit difficult sometimes in some conferences. There's a lot of BS. I'd like to say I've been out of that loop for a while, <laughs> out of the corporate scene. You know, there's a lot of positioning. There's a lot of looking at, you know, the titles on your lanyards, all that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, the, you know, that goes with the territory, right? I right. Mean, so let's. Do you let's, actually enjoy yourself when you go there? Do you cut through all that? Do you talk to well, people? I mean, yeah. I mean, like I love talking to people, right? And and to be fair, if I go to like the tech, con like if I go to Texas, I know a lot of people that are there. So for me, it's a way to catch up with people that I haven't seen in a while. Right. But but more than that, it means that now I've got got to figure out like who I can talk to in passing and who I can make the time for, right? So at this particular event, I was actually helping somebody raise some money. So we spent some time talking to the venture capitalists and, and sort of the investors. And that's a different element altogether. We, let's talk about that later. But let's think about the difference between TechSauce and the Tech in Asia stuff and the Echelon Summit, which has 2,000 people. Now, each or 2,500 people apiece, right? Let's just back up and talk about Rise. Right, so Rise is a conference along with Slush that sort of bills itself as, you know, it's a little bit of a party in a way. Yeah. Right, so if you look at the Slush page, it's you know it's got a big headline: "Nothing normal ever changed a damn thing," and the quote is from the founder of Spotify. Now, Spotify isn't even really a startup. Hmm. Right, so they say that there were seventeen thousand five hundred people at the event in Helsinki, and the quote is: "It's crazy. It's big. It's awesome." It's a party. You look at, as you say, look at the page, right? Lots of people, hands in the air. Yeah, lots it could of be a rave. rave. So it could be a rave, and I think, and I think, Rise is actually the same thing. So I spoke to people that were at Rise. I did not go. First of all, I think both of these conferences are not priced 
for startups no. to have an effective experience. They're too expensive. My view on this is that, and I think that, um, I think actually that Echelon does this a little bit too, although I haven't checked the pricing recently, but for sure, Texas did this. Like, Basically, if you want to have the conference to make money for yourself, go for it, okay? But Rise said they had 15,000 people in Hong Kong. The cheapest ticket there is $157. And that's about that's about $5.2 million of revenue, mm. okay? But if you also look at, you know, Slush, and it's all the same kind of stuff, right? They'll tell you who their sponsors are. And, you know, if you go to, sorry, if you go to the Rise page, it's like Microsoft and Singtel, and all these people are sponsoring as well. So what's the revenue associated with a conference that's that big? If the point for you is just to create a gigantic kind of startup party, then I say go for it. But if the point for you is really just to meet people, I say go to a smaller conference, right? right because yeah. the guy who's traveling all the way from San Francisco to go to Rise, it really is just going to hang out with the chief marketing officer from Uber. Because those people consider themselves on the same level. And the likelihood, in my mind, for those people to meet like real startup people that need real investment, that are there to find a mentor and all that other kind of stuff, I think it's something like Rise or like Slush. I just don't think it's going to happen. And, and again, maybe I'm out of the loop, but I don't think so. I haven't heard a story where someone's gone to one of those conferences and come away with a $250,000 investment from someone that they didn't already know. Hmm. Right, that they hadn't already been having meetings with, right? Because the if you look at the way the speed matching takes place at these conferences, and I'm sure that Slush and Rise have kind of way better areas than something like Texas or even Echelon has. Right? Like if you go to Echelon in Singapore, there's a little bit of kind of like a coffee area set up off to the side. But it's all noisy and you know, people are tired after the second day. And that's the other thing too. For a conference that's like two days long. Definitely don't expect to get anything big done on the second day, mm. particularly for a place that people have to travel to. I know that's sort of bad sentence construction, but but the reality is that everyone that goes there is there for the first day. If there's a post-event party, like on the first day, that means the second day, everyone's coming late. And if there are 2,000 people there on day one, there are 1,200 people there on day two. And a lot of the international people will have left because they're real, and a lot of the local people will have left too because they're really only there to like meet people on the first day, and then and then going away. Mm -hmm. But again, these like these big events like slush, which are fun, tons of fun to go to, and I never heard someone go and say, "Oh, boy, I didn't enjoy myself," but I never heard anybody come away saying that they've actually um, accomplished something, right? And I think the marketing around this is really for slush and rise to make a ton of money. I don't think a conference that has 15,000 people in it, whether it's for startups, for investment banks, you know, even South by Southwest has a ton of people go. But unless it's a movie that's going to get funded, right? Because remember, South by Southwest is heavily skewed towards entertainment, but it's a, it is a conference that's a few days long that has a ton of people going there. And I think the, the more sort of, the bigger these things get, the less likely that anything big is going to happen for something that wasn't going to happen anyway. Mm. Right. So go ahead. Well, back up a little bit there, because from my experience, I spent many years going to the GSM Congress, which was always held originally held in Cannes in the South of France, then moved to Barcelona. Right. And that would be 40, 50,000 people. And I think these days it's even more. Could be. You're talking about the mobile conference, yeah. right? The Mobile World Congress, right? So that was three yeah, yeah, yeah. GSM. It's, it's it's had a number of different names. I think now it's the Mobile World Congress, right? So that right. would have forty, fifty thousand, but that would be a week. And you know, the thing with that was that would be the one event of the year that people would book in. They would make time for. They would book their the hotels a year in advance. They'd book their flights, etc. And they would just do that one event. And they wouldn't go right. to anything else during the rest of the year, right? Because that one event would make up for it. And that became, it was sort of polarized the whole industry. It was all 3GSM, so Mobile World Congress, and everything right. else was sort of the crumbs off the plate, if you like. But that was it though, right? In other words, that was the only event really that anybody attended that whole year. You could get the CEO of Vodafone there. Oh right? yeah, they were the chief there. technical officer of Vodafone and Samsung goes and Microsoft went and exactly. like they announced products there. This is a big deal. The boats were there. The yachts Everything. Were, yeah. And parties. It was parties every night. And that's, you know, that's where a lot of the relationships were sealed, right? I think that's what a lot of people came for. A lot of people didn't actually go to the conferences. And, you know, right. they would just have meetings off-site. 
for the four or five days that they were there, right? So that whole sort of infrastructure had grown out around outside of it, which maybe isn't in these sort of medium level events that we're talking about. You know, there was a village, that, a whole city that came with these events, right, and built right. itself. So, right, so you, you just actually mentioned a really great point, and that is if you want to be as effective as you possibly can be before you go, make sure you set up meetings prior to attending the conference, any conference. I think this is key, hmm. right? And always try to get and, – and I understand the point you're trying to make, and I want to get back to that in a second too, but always try to get meetings outside the conference area. So if you meet somebody there that you find really interesting, I think the key to them is to say – look, it's really noisy here. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. I don't think we can have a substantive conversation. Let's try to find a way to meet either later before the after party or the following day if you're still going to be in town because that's where you ha can have a real conversation. So maybe you get people to, you do what I was saying earlier, you get a ton of people to like you and then you just kind of follow up with them and watch their behavior and see who the really important people are and then you try to plan meetings with them afterwards, right? Because right? let's talk about, like you said, at, at the... Mobile World Congress, most of those people, because it was the one time a year that everybody got together, again, I can see, I can imagine like the CEO of AT&T or Verizon walking over and seeing the CEO of Vodafone and they know each other, they speak to each other, but they rarely get to, you know, see each other in person. Mm. And that's where they catch up with each other. And then they talk about new products and new things and new partnerships that they can handle there. And they do that because they're in the same city at the same time. The real question to me is, right, so think about this. Slush in Tokyo, I did a little research. They had, there were 5,000, just listen to these numbers, they're really interesting, right? They had 5,000 people there. Okay, it was a Tokyo big site, I think. Mm -hmm. Of those 5,000 people, they had 500 startups. This is according to their documentation, unless I missed something, right? So you can double check. 200 investors and 250 journalists. Who the hell else was there? Exactly. I, I went to that event, Michael. Did this year, right? Yeah. So I went to yeah, that event. It was, a big, it was a big site. Was it a mob scene? Like I didn't go, but who else was there? Exactly. Who who were these people? It's exactly what I, you know. That was the question I was thinking at the time. There's a. I mean, it may be a Japanese thing. There was a lot of corporates no. there. Yeah, yeah, maybe. There's a lot of people who were coming from Hitachi or NEC or Panasonic just to sort of check out the startup scene. Right. Yeah, but, I don't know. So, yeah. But again, I don't think that's conducive necessarily. Like, I think the bigger the event is, the less likely you are that anything substantive right. is going to happen there. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a startup, pretty much the first 4,000 people at that event are useless to you, right? Yeah, and most of them don't know what to do with you either, right? So exactly. if you walk over to a senior executive at Hitachi who's been there for 20 years, and nothing against Hitachi, great company, Toshiba, great company, right? But they've existed in a corporate environment forever. And the reason why they're yeah. there is because they understand how to actually behave inside a corporate, which is very different than running a startup. I guarantee you that. So if you're like a 23-year-old female founder, right? Yeah. Like I think of Wantedly all the time. Wantedly is a great Japanese company that exists in the human resources space, founded by, you know, this great startup lady. But I can imagine her walking around slush trying to talk to um, and she's brilliant, right? But I can just imagine her walking around um, you know, Tokyo Big Site. People would definitely want to talk to her, but the senior executive dude from like Toshiba Hitachi has no idea what to do yeah. with a startup founder to begin with, right? So, you know, what's the effectiveness for them? or for her to be able to go to that guy. Now, if she can close that, that's awesome. But I think the likelihood of that happening is really low, mm. right? That's a good point. At, at that conference. It's like their day out at the zoo, isn't it? For the, That's a bit rude, but I think that's how a lot of these large corporates treat it, right? It's they're yeah, I think going so. to see how, how startups behave, get a taste of it, right? Yeah, because if your company has 25,000 people in it, and it's not a, like, a touchy shore is a tech company, Right? But if it's not like Microsoft or Google or some company that really understands like the genesis of a software product, right? Because startups are, are, in general, software companies mm. at some level, right? You're never going to be able to understand what these people are doing. And if they're a generation behind you in age, right? So 20 years away from you, you'll, it's just a double problem for you to be able to understand what they're doing. Right. But on the flip side, if you send one of your junior employees there from a Japanese company or even from like General Electric, it doesn't really matter. They're not going to have any influence at the company anyway. So you're yeah. into this like chicken and egg problem. I don't know. 
it depends what you want to get out of this conference. But again, if you're just going there to meet people, if this is what Eric wants to know, I still think it's worth it. Right. But Do again, you, you is it worth it to just go there and sit through the presentations? Because, I mean, that's what a lot of people do. They, they go there. I mean, like you're saying about what would be the effectiveness of going to Slush, right? If you were to go there as a startup founder and you didn't know what you were saying, you'd probably spend most of your time watching the presentations, a little bit in the coffee area, and not very productive, back to the presentations. You'd walk away from it and think that's a startup conference. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think the speeches. So, and I was having this discussion post conference at least this week on both Friday and Saturday with some senior people there, venture capitalists and sort of M and A guys that sit inside. I'd say second stage or third stage um, tech companies here, right? And their view on this was really interesting. They're like, I come here if if the gate opens at nine o'clock in the morning, they show up at one, and they have mm-hmm. meetings from one until three, right, or one until four. And these are senior people. These are decision makers inside their companies or decision makers inside a venture capital company, right? So they're investing their own capital and their own time. But all they do is they they don't watch the presentations. Some of them actually make the presentations, but that's different than what Eric wants, right? The point is these these guys, and they're both men, so fair enough, they came to take meetings. And again, because there are 2,000 people there, maybe the six people that they wanted to meet were there. They met them. And then they left. Prearranged. Yeah, prearranged. So I, I actually ran to my buddy. I won't say his name. Let's just call him Bob. He was like, I got, I'd love to talk to you, but I got to go because I've got a meeting. Right. Which is fine. Right? And I had my own meetings set up, which were prearranged as well. Um, for the pitching, and, and again, I want to get to that when we're kind of almost done, right? Because I think that the way that the pitching is handled and what they'll call business matching is just an abomination. Yeah, I know. It's a it's a jo- I mean, really, you're, you're, a lot, you're a lot more straightforward than I am, right? It is a joke. And we can talk about why, right, in this particular conference, but I don't think it's unique to what happened at Texas. I think every single one of these is like this. And the bigger it is, even if the venue is nicer, I think the worse it is. Hmm. But we'll talk about that in a second, right? So that's what I would do, right, is I, I wouldn't go – to sit in on any one particular presentation in particular. And the way these things are set up, because they're set up as like a party. Mm. And and you, you'll you laugh at this, right? But like the entrance to tech sauce, so you get your badge and do all other stuff. When you walk into the main area, <laughs> it's dark. And you have to kind of go to the left to walk down a dark hallway to get into the, the sort of main arena. And at the end... Since their colors are like purple and pink, which is fine because those are kind of Thai style colors and it's in Thai and that's fine. But there was a disco ball. <laughs> I kid you not, with one of those disco lights shining on it and the ball was spinning and it was creating that kind of Studio 50. Awesome. I hope you had the dancing Seven? shoes on. You didn't have your sandals. You had your dancing shoes on. Tell me. No, I had my sandals on. And I was <laughs> going to take a picture of it, but I didn't want to be seen taking a picture of it. But I thought it was kind of weird and it kind of set the tone for me. Right, right. For later, it's like, I don't understand the point of that. But again, they are just channeling what they're seeing at other events, right? Again, if you look at the slush thing and you look at the rides thing, it's more just like a festival of drinking and getting together, more more so than a a startup thing. I mean, there there is a place for that. But back to Eric's question, it's like, you know, that's not the most effective use of your time. No, I don't think so. And that's why I say, like, you have to be really targeted when 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 you go. Again, because a whole bunch of people are going to come together. Like my recommendation is get to them before the the after party because the after party is going to be insane. And you can look at the pictures that were posted from Texas as well. It's like, you know, what stays, what happens at the after party happen stays at the after party. You know what that reference is, right? Yeah, right. Vegas. But it also what, gets posted on Facebook. <laughs> it does get posted on Facebook. It's really bad because now you're saying like right. – we're trying to have a professional event here, but afterwards everybody's going to be insane, like in Vegas right. and whatever happens that you can't talk about. So it, it's, it seems to me to send a bad message, and maybe that just means that like I'm the old guy who stands on his lawn with a shotgun and says, like, get <laughs> off my lawn. But I, don't, but I don't think so. Do you do after parties, Michael? I don't, and I'll tell you why. Here's why, right? Bec- and it was the same reason why I didn't like going to the Christmas party at Goldman Sachs or at Morgan Stanley, because <laughs> nothing good happens there. All right, yeah. Nothing. And you forget. Here's the biggest problem. And this is a problem industry-wide in tech, but I just think at every kind of thing like this, right? It's not just in tech. It's in finance. It's in manufacturing. It's everywhere. If there's a Christmas party, there are a bunch of bad things that are happening. One is everybody's drinking. Yep. 
Two is there are males and females in the same room or just people that are attracted to you and you're attracted to them and only something bad can happen. Yeah, one plus and two. you see it happen every year. Just see it happen every year. The combination of sort of alcohol and um, energy leads to really negative events. And it happens at tech conferences. Like I said, it happens at Christmas parties. And I've never been to one where I haven't looked around and said, oh. So last year or two years ago at Echelon, right? And nothing against the Echelon team because they put on an amazing conference. But the after party was at a bar. So it wasn't even on site, right? Because if it's on site, you kind of still feel like you're at the conference. Yeah. But the after party was at a bar. It was downstairs. You had to get a bracelet. It just kind of felt like you were at a party. You forget that all these people are VCs, you know, investors, founders. You forget that you know them mm. and that when you wake up tomorrow, you're going to want to either invest in their company or work with them or partner with them. But you forget. And because of that, again, bad things happen. So I think after parties, at least – in this environment, are a really bad idea. Right. So your thumbs down yeah. on after parties. Interesting. I'm really, yeah, I know. It so, sounds like it should be a great way to meet people and a great way right, to right, work, right, but yeah. I feel like it's really bad because nothing good happens there. And that's why I say, like, you got 2,000 people or 2,500 people in the room at any one point in time. Have those meetings set up because those people are in town and they may not be in town normally. But when you meet somebody, so again, at Texas last week, people would ask me if they didn't know me. So... You know, how long are you staying in Bangkok this time? I'm like, well, I live here. Oh, so that changes the conversation, right? Because that means if they're a Bangkok-based startup, and I met a few of them that were kind of cool, and you're a Bangkok-based investor or mentor or advisor or whatever, there's a lot more time to get together. And it really means it's less and less of a reason to go to the after party, right? And it means that if you have an interest in investing in somebody, you just really just take emails and then you have meetings later. It's actually better if you're in the same city. And you've met someone you didn't know, I think, to meet them outside the auspices mm -hmm. of the conference. Because I'll put you this way. I ran into a friend of mine at the conference. And I run into her often at conferences. And we looked at each other and we're like, you know what? We're going to have a two-minute conversation here because we know each other, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't we try to meet up later after the conference is over? You've got to go to the dinner. I've got to do the pitching thing. Like, let's just meet up later. Let's agree to do that. So we've agreed to do that. But again, that meeting hasn't taken place yet. Right. But you're, so, you're going to these events with a specific goal. That's the interesting thing, because I think a lot of people, and it goes back to Eric's question as well, is that we'll go to these events just to soak it up without a goal. Yeah. And no, you, you I, sort of I go with go the there. flow, don't you? You have a drink at the end of the day, and then, you know, oh, come on, we're all going to the after party, and you get swept along to the after party, and then, you know, things happen, right? So. Yeah, but so for me, I went there to meet for a very specific reason. I'm helping a startup called Trip Ally Raise Money. We arranged meetings with six or seven of the venture capitalists or the potential investors that were there. And our first meeting, I'm going to, I'm trying to remember times, but let's say our first meeting on day one started at two o'clock. I arrived at the venue at 1.45. I got my badge. I found my, I found the CEO and I walked in, we did our meetings and I, I you know, we chit chatted more. And then I was again, grabbed by the chief marketing officer of a very famous company and just grabbed by a guy who um, is starting his own venture capital fund and I caught up with them downstairs okay just chit-chatting outside the arena and talking about what makes a great startup company what you know what do you look for when you're doing an M&A how is this conference different than Rise so like Rise was actually does some interesting things right so Rise arranges the startups in order of investment stage Mm -hmm. So they don't have all the fintech companies together necessarily. They don't have all the edtech companies together, which is what this conference did, right? And I think it's a bad idea because that edtech company could be in its third round of financing. But you wouldn't know that from the sign that's there. Right, so the Rise team actually does a really good job, at least in the Hong Kong event, of saying, you know, here's the name of the company, Company X. It's based in Belgium. Um, it has an office in Hong Kong. It has 100 people in it. It's looking for Series A and a couple of other statistics about it. You're meant to fill all that in so that every company's poster has the stage and information about it. So when you walk over, you already have enough information to decide whether or not you want to talk to that company. Mm -hmm. right, but again, I would submit, and I, I, would, I think the same thing about this that I do about Texas, and that is I really don't think for a certain number of the startups that you charge them to come in. I think there's something really disingenuous about taking a startup where, in almost all cases, money or funding 
is the one resource that they don't have enough of. Right. So who's going so to pay to, though? Because I mean, VCs that's don't the point, pay though. anywhere, do they? they uh, no, the venture capitalists pay, and they do should they? pay. The VCs that I know will always get in free, more or less, to these conferences, right? I mean, unless yeah, they're coming maybe. as an individual. I mean, it, yep, it depends who you know. But so you went to Slush, did you pay? I did, yeah. Yeah, you did, I, right? I tried to get it as media, but they weren't having it. <laughs> maybe next year right. when we're a bit more famous, Michael, but this time... Though. Believe me, next year they'll be begging you to be there. <laughs> Keynote. <laughs> Yeah, but they I had paid. Like, oh my god, yeah, there's I mean, tried to get in. It, it was, you know, it's, and if I was paying as a startup, it was quite a lot of money, right? Yeah, so the startup, but so I think if you're, and this is, I'm going to get back to this, and it, again, it sounds like shrilling. I feel like, I feel like I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So the launch festival, right, in San Francisco, and they're they're going to do one in Sydney this next year, right? Basically, their idea is for the first, I'm going to pick a number because I don't know, but let's say for the first three or 400 startups that are in the festival, they, they just go for free. Yeah. Because it, for, for my money, right, like if I'm a startup company and I'm burning 10000 or $15,000 a month, why am I paying? First of all, I got to pay for a booth. I don't know what that booth costs. Remember, that booth is there mm. to make money for the, um, for the people that are sponsoring the conference. And I'll tell you what. If I look at the sponsors of this conference, Bangkok Bank, a non like you know development, so it's a it's a builder of condos, right? And then True is that all these big companies are definitely sponsoring, and good for them, right? Because for them it's a massive bonus. They get to see what's coming, they get to see startups. They build these beautiful booths, right? But they also sponsor the event. Their sponsorships should pay. Exactly. The, the bulk load of the costs, like unless you're being really disingenuous, like the launch festival really is there so people can learn about startups and it's sponsored by big companies. And I don't think, although I don't know this, that they're turning a gigantic profit there. I think they could, but I don't think they do because I don't think they want to because I don't think that it's um, philosophically part of what their mission is. If their mission is to get a bunch of people together that are really interested in finding, funding and learning about startups – I think you charge the people that have the money. Yeah. I don't think you charge the people that are trying to raise money, right? There's no reason why. Um, you know, and I was joking, right? Because the founder that I was walking around with, he paid for a ticket. Okay. Now, theoretically, he should pay for mine. Exactly. Because I'm there for him only. I'm not there for me because if I wasn't there with him, I wouldn't be there. Well, here's the thing with conferences as well. The biggest cost for the organizers is the marketing, right? You know, they spend a year yep. building the list, hitting the list, getting the sponsors, doing all the logistics to get these events. And, you know, it's all, hap it's all over in a couple of days. And then they have to start everything again. So if they were to build a community rather than just, you know, dragnet the whole thing and get as much money as they can out of the startup. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 I talked to the guys that put the, that put the thing together, the, the two main guys. I mean, I talked to one of them, really. Tech and source? I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, text us. And I was like, oh my God. Because it was, look, at some level, it's ridiculously impressive what they've accomplished, right? There are three separate rooms. It's all set up. Like, it's who knows how many volunteers they have. Like, just logistically, this is really hard to do. And it's not like they started doing it in, like, this was in what, July? It's not like they started doing it in May. They probably started doing it last July. Yeah. As soon as as soon as Texas won, and this is the second one, I believe. I don't think it's the third, but the second one. As soon as the last one was over, they just shifted right back into high gear and said, "We got to do the next one. It's got to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, whatever." Right? Exactly. And they did do it, but boy, like, it feels like if you really want to put on a conference, that's if they're just doing it to make money, good for you. Like, really good for you, and you did a super good job. You had all the right sponsors there. You had enough people there. Well done. But if you're doing it to help build an ecosystem, and if you want the ecosystem to support you over time, you got to restructure the way you finance it, I think, unless I'm missing something, because I think it's better to finance it. Your biggest sponsor should pay for every one of the startups that's there to pitch. Because if you're, like, if I were a startup, I'd never have a booth. Yeah. All right. Well, Ever. Michael, let me hand it back to you. If you were to do this, I mean, if you could choose an event, any scale, it could be a large conference it could be a small intimate event but you had to put an event to do exactly what you said to build the tech ecosystem what would it look like would you be doing so a tech source type event or you'd be doing something no, too else? big too big 
And also, I think, and so I was thought, thought about this when I walked around, right? So there was a room in there where they had panels, five or six panels talking about things. I'm not sure, and I'm not sure, right? But I think if you just want to get a bunch of people together, there are ways to do it where, like, it, it's much more curated, right? Like, I like to live a curated life. And I think that you can curate an event in a way where you get really big sponsors, and those sponsors pay, they subsidize the existence of the startups, which means that you can also, because remember, people that are coming in from out of town, like, um, you know, the, the venture capitalists, the investors, they're basically spending their management fee mm. to come and do it, right? So yeah. you want to minimize, you want to minimize their costs as well. And you want to give them an incentive to actually, and give them an environment because all they want to do, right? The most important thing, if you talk to your best investors in the world, the best investors in the world, they'll really tell you that, um, that three things matter. Okay. And the first thing is, um, meeting, meeting the right startups. Okay. The second thing is picking the right startups. If you're an investor, right? And the third thing is getting into the deal. Can I get in? Right. Because even if you meet the right, right startup founders, um, if you don't pick the right ones, you're out. And then if you can't get into the deal, even if you pick the right ones, then you're out. So what are you doing? So I think you want to create a conference that creates an environment where all the right startups are there. right? So they, have the, they run these competitions, but I don't think the people that judge the competitions in the satellite sort of zones really make a lot of sense. Because again, if you look at the people that get sent to these satellite events, it's the junior person from a really great venture capital company. Right, so they're not the people that are actually going to make an investment decision. And again, if you look at the way people behave at the conference, maybe they're hungover on the second day. Like, I really don't think it's it's the right way to do it. So, what would I do? I'd curate the whole thing, and I'd spend a lot of time having I'd spend a lot of time having my team before it gets to that point, vetting the startups like three or four a month. That's it, and I'd vet them globally. So, I'd create global partnerships with people. They can also have really strong input into what the startups are. And then at the end of that year, or maybe every six months, maybe is the best way to do it, right? You then, Because remember, most startups don't want to wait a year to get funded. Maybe you're on a six-month cycle. And every six months, you take the best startups. It could just be five. It could be ten. And instead of having conversations around, like, what is, what's new in AI this year? What's the big trend? Because people make up questions that aren't really relevant. Yeah. What I would do is I'd create an environment where those startups aren't running a five-minute pitch or a three-minute pitch or get on stage and do this kind of stuff where they can have a substantive conversation with a real investor who's thinking about a real sector and a real stage of investment where they're going to invest. And that's what I would do. And the other thing I would do is if I'm going to get all these people together for two days, I might run a um, sort of a startup education thing. Where if the startup is there, since I've been funded by Microsoft or Cisco or, you know, Qualcomm, I can actually take the time to bring in other founders that have already been funded, have already been successful and say, here's how I scaled. Hmm. Here's how I did my SEO. Like, but real people talking about real things that will help the, fu- the founders of these companies, whether or not they get funded, right? Right. So they're talking about and them think- and their journey rather than the domain knowledge, right? Which is... Totally different yeah, because, to most yeah, conferences, because, right? Because you can sit up on stage, right, and have a panel that goes, like, what is the new trend in AI? No, right, but exactly. that's, like, today's trend. Nobody gives a shit, excuse my language. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, because, it change, because it changes. But, but well, Why also, do I need to go to a conference for that, right? I mean, that's the whole point. You don't, really. I so the point that. is, yeah, exactly. And if I want to get people together in a room or at a venue, right. I want to have it be the most effective, and it's expensive for everyone to do, I want to have it be the most effective event that it can possibly be, and I think you eliminate some of the noise and the sort of the gamification that takes place around it, I wouldn't make it a party, yeah. right, because I think that that distracts from the professionalism of it, again, maybe it's just me, but I think you want to professionalize this whole thing, and if you look at the places where the best startups really want to go, and where they really get funded, right, because most, startup, most startups don't go to get funded for Series A or Series B, they're already okay, right? Because Series A funds growth. And if you have growth, you're going to get funded whether you go to a conference or not. Yeah. The funding in a conference, to me, particularly in Asia, is about like seed stage funding. 
Right. But right. You, you, and if, you go, go back ahead. to what you said, because you talk about getting those people into a room rather than a conference, right? I think, you, you know, what you want to achieve and what you're saying, you have to kind of deconstruct the whole conference model, don't you? You've got to take away that whole go on stage, talking to 2,000 people, talking about, you know, his thing, whatever. You've got to kind of break that whole thing down. You're talking about something else here. Yes. Yeah, so let me give you an example of what the business matching or what I'll call the sort of speed dating, which I hate. Think about the concept of that speed dating. Would you ever speed date? No. Absolutely not. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're, I, married, I hate, like, I, abs- did, I absolutely hate it anyway. I just think, yeah, it's I just, just, I mean, it's okay. It's, not, I mean, it's okay if it's just for fun. But yeah, sure. Right. You want to have a speed dating game? Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to play games, but like if you want to really go and fund a real serious startup, no. here's what happened. Okay. So you have a 15 minute window. Here's exactly what happened at this conference, right? You have a 15 minute window. Okay. So, but first you have to get your thing scanned. So when you get your, um, your little tag, your name tag scanned, you're taking away a minute right there. If you have an advisor, which my guy did, that's two people. So now you're talking about 90 seconds. That's a lot of time. Hmm. You sit down, but now there are three of us. They only have seating for two, so we've got to find another place to sit. Now you're talking two or three minutes wasted. The setup that they had was so cramped and really like poorly constructed. It was almost like, you know, it was unsturdy. You can go read stuff on it. Like I can, I can post stuff on this, but it was really an unsturdy construction, and it was two floors. And I'll tell you, walking up those stairs to the second floor scared me and scared everybody that did it. But the point is that. Once you, once you get to your seat, there's a woman making an announcement already. You only have 15 minutes. That's not true because now you only have like 11 minutes by the time you sit down. And at the five-minute time – and she's making it in two languages, which is completely unnecessary because if you're pitching to global investors, you're English. speaking English. Right? You're speaking – and if, even if you're not, so if you're a Thai startup pitching to a, sty, a Thai venture capitalist and you're at that conference – the chances of you not being able to speak English at the level where you can understand like five minutes left is pretty close to zero. So in the, at, when it's five minutes left, an announcement, loudly, yeah? And it has to be loud because it's right in the middle of the conference center room. So there's so much noise there anyway. I could tell and you love this. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> in two languages. It's really annoying. What if you're, in the, what if you're at the climax of your pitch? Yeah. So and now you're just interrupted. It's and, just and crazy then, pressure then, as well, right? I mean, that's just, it's, it's not a good environment. Right? Mind. It's a crap environment from the beginning. But then with a minute left, it's like a minute left. And again, they're still talking. And then when there's five seconds left, the woman would stand up and count down five, four, yeah. three. I'm still talking, right? Two, one. And the, this is the worst part was that a bell went off. No way. And I mean like a bell. Like, <laughs> like, like a school marm bell that went off like when you were in like your first grade. Right, right, right. And it went off loudly like you were at recess, like recess is over kind of thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you were dumb and you were like way out in the playground and you didn't know you were done with kickball or whatever you were doing. And it's like coming to class, you're all sweaty because you're seven years old. Right. And the bell went off. But that, this I made mean, me the, really mad, actually. I, I can imagine. And this goes back to your point about everybody just copying everybody else in the conferences, right? Because this has been done elsewhere. And people I think, guess oh, so. That's a good idea. Let's do it in our conference, right? People haven't really thought about it. Haven't really thought about it in the way that you're sort of, ta- you know, you're saying. You've got to think out of the box. I know that's, a, that's an old cliche, but you really have to here, right? Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, I just want to f- find this quote because I thought it was actually really interesting. Nah, I lost it. But anyway, so they interviewed a bunch of people later to find out what they thought, right? And I think this one very well-respected person basically said, I felt nervous when I got on the, on, on the platform because I thought like it was rickety. It was really shaky. Mm. Um, second, the bell. Why are you ringing a bell? We're adults. We're not like farm animals, right? <laughs> so don't do that. And the third thing was like, why are we constantly getting interrupted? We know there's 15 minutes. We don't need to be told. When it's done, why not just come and tap us on the shoulders and treat us like with respect? Because the rest of the way the whole process was done, I thought was really disrespectful to the entrepreneurs and to the venture capitalists. Wow. Because we were actually in one of our pitches, we were talking to this um, VC who loved the idea and really liked the founder. And we're in the middle of a conversation and the bell goes off and this guy was not happy. And then someone came on and, and, you know, 
he was really interested in talking more. So he wanted more than the 13 minutes or 12 minutes that we had. And he literally told the person who came over, I got it. Don't worry about it. I'm still talking. Yeah. Right, so I don't like that whole concept of like there's a fixed, there's a finite amount of time. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. And if it is a finite amount of time, make it 30 minutes a meeting. Right. Like these, these VCs have come all the way from some other part of the world. Like why not just give them 30 minutes and let them figure it out themselves? They're adults. Well, you don't like it, but is there any value in – let's go back to Eric. I mean, would, could he benefit out of those kind of events, those speed dating type things? Could anybody get some kind of value out of it or they really are a waste of time? I think that is a complete waste of time. <laughs> I really do because I think there's a. I think everyone that's doing it knows that there's a better way to do it, right? It's like, look, you, you live in Japan. I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe you never did this, right? But like, there's this thing called a gokon, right? So five guys, five girls get together, see if they like each other, they drink a little bit, and then later yeah. they'll like re, re get together. Compa. And you period. Yeah, you periodically hear that, like, oh, I met Akiko at this thing, and we ended up getting married. But it's rare. People still do it because it's fun, but it's rare that anything good comes out of it. And this speed dating thing, I think, particularly where there's like intellect and depth mm. and large sums of money involved, it's just a bad way to do it. Is there, What is the better way? We don't have much time, but is there a better way of doing it? We can just kind of give people – I mean, the conference organizers out there, who people who listen to this show – come on, we've got to give them some help here. How can you yeah, do there's it a, no, there's, a, there's a much better way to do it, right? Like I said, most people are only taking four meetings a day, right? So if there are 15 or 20 VCs there, they're each taking four meetings a day because there aren't that many interesting companies there too. And it's hard to figure out who is and who isn't interesting, um, you know, in a 15 minute presentation. So what I think you do is you say, you have four slots, each one of them is 30 minutes. They're not back to back. So you have – because you're going to be there for two hours anyway, right? So why not just take a 30-minute meeting in a, in a small room without a bell, and when the meeting's over at 30 minutes, just have someone you know, kind of knock on the door and say, time's up. Yeah. But remember, there's a buffer time of 10 minutes in between the meeting where you can either stay in the meeting or go get a glass of water or a cup of coffee. Because now you're having a really intelligent conversation. And if it just doesn't work, so if you sit down and say – you know, I'm going to write a photo app that is going to be better than Instagram and, and more targeted than Facebook. Maybe the VC just stands up and says, okay, that's insane. It's never going to happen. And just, you know, politely walks out. Mm. But it's better than being in a conversation where there's really only 11 minutes, a bell rings at the end, you're still in the middle of pitching, and someone's really interested, or they know someone that's really interested, but the whole flow is broken. Right. I, think, I think you'd rather have more time than less. But you have to do a little bit of background research in that model, right? You have to do a little bit of matchmaking beforehand because you're, you're dealing with quality rather than quantity, aren't you? But isn't that the idea? Right. If you're going to the conference to meet someone yes. to invest in, you should do your homework anyway regardless. And don't come to me and tell me it's your job as the entrepreneur to teach me the whole thing. Like I didn't do any work on this. I don't want you as my investor. Yeah. I really don't. Like just get away from me. I don't want you as my investor because you've done no work. So does that mean you're always going to do no work? Yeah, I guess that's a little bit of an aggressive comment at the end here, but I just think, but I just think, you know, in the same way that like, let's just take a typical example of two people getting married, right? And I'm not going to be sexist or anything, but like when a man asks a woman to marry her, she's not obligated to say yes if that guy's a jerk. And money's a commodity, I think, in the investment world, and there's more money sloshing around the startup world than anywhere else in the world right now. Mm. You don't have to choose the first. You don't have to marry the first person you dance with. Is the thing that I like to tell some of the startups that I, that I advise. Money's a commodity. Try to pick the person and, and the institution that's gonna help you the most. And I think that the way to create that is not at a five minute or a 10 minute pitching event or at a pitching competition. I think it's no. a really bad way to do it. It's a circus. It is, and I periodically go back and look at some of the companies that have won the pitching competition. Yeah. Like a year later or whatever, I just go revisit it. I'd say in nine times out of ten, that company is either bankrupt or still really struggling. Yeah. And there are startups yeah. that live for pitching competitions as well. Yeah, and just because you like, can pitch well doesn't mean – just because you can yeah. pitch well on stage for five minutes doesn't mean you're going to be a great business. Yeah. It would be great to hear yeah. listeners' feedback on what they found that worked in these startup conferences, particularly when it comes to the matchmaking side of things because there is a better world out there, right? 
We're curious. We don't so. have all the answers, right? We may be missing something no. else. Maybe there's something they've seen in a conference somewhere in the world. It doesn't have to be a conference either, right? You know, it could be a meetup yeah. or a smaller event. Something that they thought, wow, that's a really good idea. And it, it takes somebody to try something out, take a bit of a risk outside of the norm of what conferences do, right? Try yeah, something. Look, I'd love... I'd love to hear somebody's opinion. I'd love to hear like a contrary opinion to these pitching events, whether it's standing on stage and you have five minutes and then a buzzer goes off and then you do five minutes of Q&A oh, yeah. in front of an audience of 400 people or whoever's there. And remember, those people are on their phone or talking to their mother or doing something. It's just, it just seems like a bad environment to me. So tell me I'm wrong. And tell me how to make it better. I have an idea, but I'd like to know what your idea is as well. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. If anybody out there thinks that those pitching contests and those speed dating, matchmaking between investors and startups is a good idea. And they've had a good experience. That would be good to hear as well. They can tweet us at Asia Tech Pod, at Asia Tech Pod, or hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. Comment on Facebook. Direct message us. The usual. We would love to hear. Because we don't have yeah. all the stories, the monopoly on the stories out there. So, No, I like to say I have an opinion, but I don't have a monopoly on the right opinion. So I agree yeah. with you. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, the, the gauntlet's been thrown down for somebody to do this, right? <laughs> Please. So I, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, I think it has been thrown down, actually. And I think there's a better way. And I think we can conceptualize a better way. Do you think we could do a better event ourselves, Michael? Are we giving yeah, away too many be- secrets here? We should, yeah, we should, because we, we would do smaller, right? Because the idea would be, I don't want to do the event to make money off the event. I want to do yeah. the event to provide a service for people, right? So I'm happy to break even. It's what I really would love to find out, here's what I would, would make me happy, is that at, when the event was over, a VC came over to me and said, I found, you know, I'm running a $25 million fund, and we're doing seed stage for up to 250 grand a piece, and I found two companies here that I need to invest in because they're so good. And then I find 10 companies out of the... 400 that are there that say I-, I got funded because of this like unless something bad happens in my next meeting with these guys i think i got funded that yeah. would make me happy and if at the end of the day you and i can look at each other and say we broke even done right you have to have a different mindset though you're talking about having a vested interest in the relationships before and after the event right which is not Absolutely. the conference model the conference model is very different right yep so I think that whole thing can be disrupted too. Big surprise. Do we have time? I don't think we do. It's too long. To oh, I was looking that. forward to that. I was looking forward to let that. Me just, you, let, you, yeah. you build it up. You build it up. Come on. I did. Can I you know. Give we us talked a, about it. Can we give it a little bit? Oh. Come on. Five, okay. So, two, do it. so a year ago, so a year ago, <laughs> this company called, a year ago, there's a fintech company, right? I'm really into fintech called T2P. They, they took in a million dollars, $1.1 million from 500 startups. And Bencha Chinda, right, which is, you know, Venture Chinda Holding, okay, and that's owned by the family that founded DTAC. So good for them for making an investment in a, in a mobile wallet company and a fintech company. It's really important. So this deep pocket thing really wants to disintermediate, you know, the whole concept of how, how people pay, right? So, and you know that, like, the, the fintech business worldwide is about a $400 business, which it says in this announcement that they made in Deal Street Asia last year. And this was in May of last year, so a little bit more than a year ago. Right? So that's great. And I, look, I love when people that are trying to do things different get funded. And then there was an announcement today. I believe it was today. Um, lose, I lost it, actually. I'm sorry. But there was an announcement today that, you know, that, these, that, these, uh, that this team actually took in another $3 million of funding. This is really fabulous news. Um, but it, but it's funded by the same people that funded it before. And I will say this, right? Though they got into the DTAC Accelerate program, which is really cool, but not a big surprise when you're funded by DTAC. Mm. And not a big surprise when it, the DTAC funding itself is not necessarily the entire funding, but it's funded by the family that funds DTAC. Like, I love these mobile companies and I love the concept of mobile wall and nothing makes me happier than seeing a company get funded and, and get follow on funding, right? Raise their series a or post series a thing. But I at least want the people that are making the announcement to be at least straightforward when they say that they, that like, you know, it just says Ben, Ben Chachinda holdings and that they got into TTAC, DTAC accelerate. But like, let's be at least truthful about who's actually doing the funding and why they get in. And I don't think it would be a big surprise, right? Because, there are so many other people competing in the fintech sector. Like, I'd love to hear more about what the details are of this funding and why. $3 million is a lot of money for a company in Thailand getting funded by a Thai corporate to figure out why that's going to work. 
But frankly, I wouldn't be surprised to see some other company come in and in, in the fintech space and just blow these guys away. I'd love to find out where they are in a year. Mm. So it's not a big surprise that they got funded, but let's do something really big. Awesome. That's really it. Thank you, Michael. Good session today. We Thanks, talked man. around the houses when it came to talking about conferences and events in Asia. And we did. We would love to hear people's feedback on that. And if you disagree with us, we'd love to hear your feedback. If you agree with us, whatever, just tweet us Asia Tech Pod, hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. Catch us up on Facebook or catch us in Asia when we hit the road. We are starting in three, four weeks, right? We need to start talking about that. So we'll be back next week and we'll start dropping details of our tour. So yeah, we're finalizing dates, right? So that's very exciting. Exactly. First city? Fukuoka. See you there. We will be there. So yeah, catch us. Asia Tech Podcasts dot com slash tour if you want details of the tour where we're going to be it catches on the road and we won't necessarily be hanging out at the biggest events so you can catch us <laughs> smaller <laughs> coffee shops smaller. and co-working spaces that's where we'll be exactly michael thank you so much for your time and your insights today we'll catch you next week thank you graham you've been listening to asia tech podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com